Hey there, REM PCs. Welcome to Rules of Cool, where we interview very special guests, creators, game designers, and world builders. I'm your host, Rem Alternis, and today I'm really excited to be talking with distinguished role-playing game designer, Kenneth Height. Kenneth is the author of Trail of Cthulhu and Knights Black Agents, and is the lead designer of the fifth edition of Vampire the Masquerade, and has a mile-long list of other credits in gaming and writing. And then stay tuned become, because up next at 5 p.m. PDT is the next episode of Shadowrun 6th edition Emerald Glitch. If you're new to the show, welcome. Every week we do an awesome giveaway. This week it's a PDF of the Shadowrun 6th World Core Rulebook Seattle edition. Enter for free by typing hashtag RemPC in the chat and get bonus entries by supporting us at www.remalternus.com slash nuyen or www.patreon.com slash remalternus. Also, remember to enter a message if you donate. The highest donors will have their message read by all of our Shadowrunners at the end of the show. Now time to get right into our conversation for this week, so stay tuned, REM PCs. Welcome back. I'm really excited to introduce you today to Kenneth Height, uh, who is a great game developer, has, has quite the history under his belt. I, I looked you up on Wikipedia just to like get all my details right. And I was like, wow, <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> well, that, that, that was your first mistake was using Wikipedia to get the details right. But <laughs> I mean, fair. Yeah. Uh, but why don't you introduce yourself and tell us uh, a little bit about who you are? Um, I'm Kenneth Height. I'm a role-playing game uh, designer and uh, sometime writer of other things that are not role-playing games. Uh, for example, my book, Tour to Lovecraft, The Destinations, a bunch of essays about Lovecraft settings, uh, just uh, is in game stores, I think starting was in, in game stores in June, so, mm. or in March, maybe, one of those months. They all blur together nowadays, but it's out now, and <laughs> so every now and again, I write one of those, and then back to the uh, role-playing game minds uh, to chunk out more joy. Awesome. Uh, so how, tell us a little bit about how you got into gaming to begin with. I mean, I got into gaming by the uh, very unique uh, uh, circumstance of being a 12 year old nerd in 1977. <laughs> I feel like that's a really good way to suddenly get into Dungeons and Dragons. Everyone I knew did at the time. Um, and that's really what it was. It was, uh, I think my friend Steve uh, had a copy of the Monster Manual and was very excited. No one knew what it was. And he loaned it to me for the summer. And I spent all summer making up monsters with no idea of what the rules meant. And then when, you know, school started, we had the, uh, you know, the Holmes Blue Book and we, oh, this is what that went to somehow. And we started playing. And then, you know, uh, Player's Handbook came out. We moved over to AD&D and we just kept going. Call of Cthulhu dropped in 1981 and I became a permanent uh, Call of Cthulhu uh, ah. keeper forever. The, the you know, DM for life brand was put into my head right around then. Uh, and then I've never stopped because it's it's terrific. I mean, I don't need to tell anyone on this channel how great tabletop role playing games are. Uh, right. But it was it was great fun sort of growing up with the art form, I guess, in a lot of ways, right? That, you know, you start, I started out when everyone started out, you know, stabbing carrion crawlers in a hallway. And <laughs> now I'm stabbing vampires in a much nicer hallway. So it's obviously a <laughs> huge progress on my part. <laughs> You've made it so far in, in all this time, still mm -hmm. in hallways, stabbing. Yeah. <laughs> Someday I'm going to get to a room and that's going to be exciting. <laughs> Excellent. So how did how did uh, the transition from gamer into game designer start? Well, uh, like I said, I ran Call of Cthulhu for my friends uh, in high school and in college. Uh, one of my players got a job at Iron Crown Enterprises, which was a different role-playing game company. And 
because he was there, he saw a early playtest draft of uh, Nephilim, the Chaosium version of the French occult role-playing game. And he said, you know who needs to see this? My old black magic and conspiracies Call of Cthulhu game master. So he sent me the draft and I wrote about 11,000 words of back, back sass and I sent it to Chaosium and Greg Stafford himself reached down from the sky and said, <laughs> this is great. We're going to put it in the book and pay you. What's the next book you're writing for us? And wow. that was it. Uh, at roughly the same period I sold, uh, or I, I sold Steve Jackson on the concept of <laughs> GURPS Alternate Earths with my friends, uh, Craig Newmar and Mike Schiffer. And we wrote that uh, for him right around that same time. And very rapidly, it became sort of my side gig and it, you know, it, it let me go to Gen Con as a pro and paid for my game books. And then slowly my wife noticed that I was happier as a writer than I was working for an insurance company and what? said, why don't, why don't you just do that full time? And I said, because we will starve and be thrown in the street. And she said, I, you know, I'm okay with you starving and being thrown in the street. So that's, uh, that's what happened so far. We have not starved. We are not in the street. Uh, that's 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 the story, right? That's awesome. Great. Um, so can so so uh, you've been kind of living the dream of of being a successful game designer that's not living in the street. Um, mm -hmm. Can you walk us through the milestones uh, of your career? I mean, the the first ones were those uh, those sales to Steve Jackson and to Chaosium. Uh, I got a lot of steady work from Steve Jackson on Inamine that became steady work with a bunch of other uh, companies. White Wolf uh, threw me a lot of work for some of their early stuff. And then uh, Chaosium hired me to be line developer for Nephilim. And I put a couple of books out in that line. And based, I think, on that, uh, I met Ross Isaacs, who was a writer for Nephilim. And he got me in on the ground floor of designing the Star Trek role-playing game for uh, Last Unicorn. Uh, you know, uh, Christian Moore, who ran Last Unicorn, had hired him, and he said, you need to get this guy Ken Hyde on, and Christian and I got along great, and so he hired me, I think, like a week after he hired Ross, and so Ross and I, and eventually Steve Long and some other great designers and Christian yeah. uh, put together that Last Unicorn icon system that became the Star Trek role-playing game engine, and uh, that, you know, that got me, you know, full-time job with Last Unicorn. I uh, paid the down payment on my house, which, Ooh. you know, solved that street problem for a bit. And then <laughs> um, when the Star Trek license went to uh, Decipher, uh, I followed it, basically, after a brief stint at Wizards of the Coast, uh, working on the Call of Cthulhu D20 project that Monty uh, basically snatched from my hands and then uh, ran with uh, Monty Cook. So I was then at uh, Upper Deck for a while, or rather Decipher, doing uh, their Star Trek game, Coda uh, system. And I can tell you that nothing will give you better chops as a designer than to design uh, the same game in two entirely different game engines. Uh, that definitely, I don't recommend it as a, a, a jaunt, but it certainly gets your reflexes going. <laughs> then after that, I had a... a a staff designer uh, job, staff writer job with Steve Jackson Games for a while. And then I got hired by Pelgrane to do Trail of Cthulhu. And from there, uh, it's basically been whenever I have a, a big game in me, I, I, uh, I uh, sell it to Pelgrane and they're nice enough to publish it. And that's basically been the story uh, with the occasional side trip uh, for my own stuff uh, ever since. Cool. So, so you kind of just touched on this and I want to expand on it. So all these ideas for games and game systems and stuff like that, that at, now that you're, you're handing them to, to Pelgrane in terms of partnership, like how do these ideas keep coming and, and like, what is your inspiration? What do you look to and, and how do you even get started in that? I mean, it's, I mean, every project is different. Uh, for example, trail of Cthulhu came about because Simon uh, had the gumshoe engine that Robin Laws had designed for Esoteris and Fear Itself, and he wanted to do a licensed version of Call of Cthulhu for it, and he asked me if I wanted to do that. And so that was a very straightforward assignment, translate Call of Cthulhu into gumshoe, 
And, you know, so I didn't have to do anything. Knights Black Agents, on the other hand, I came up with standing on a, a subway platform in Chicago uh, in uh, summer thinking this is vampire season. This is when the vampires are out. And then thinking, and I'm on a subway platform at night. What an idiot am I? And then thinking, there's not a good vampire hunting game, is there? There should be a vampire hunting game uh, because Buffy had, you know, was sort of gone. Uh, Hunter the Vigil hadn't come out yet. Or uh, I forget, maybe it was in the process. I, I forget exactly where that stage was. But there, there was a window for a vampire hunting game. And I thought, well, who would hunt vampires? Jason Bourne, that's who would hunt vampires. That's who you would send <laughs> after a vampire. And that literally, while I'm standing there on the subway, it takes about 45 seconds for me to, to think of Nice Black Agents and say, that's the game I want to I want to design for Pelgrane. And that was me sort of pitching it to Simon. He says, well, if you can make it work, I'll, I'll print, I'll publish it. And then I ran a play test for my game group to make sure it could work. And if That's not, awesome. then uh, it was just, you know, their problem. But a lot of times it's, it's the client comes to me and says, we need this done. Uh, when, um, uh, uh, but other times I just have an idea and I say, what if Conan, but right after World War II and also the Midgard Serpent was real and that becomes Day After Ragnarok. And that idea came about doing the suppressed transmission column for Steve Jackson Games where I literally had to come up with a wild idea every week to put in the column. And again, uh, I don't know that it's anyone's idea of a day at the beach, but it'll certainly give you practice coming up with wild ideas. <laughs> fair, yeah. fair. Um, so... You've touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to get some more detail. You've, you've won several awards for your work on Trail of Cthulhu. So how did that project come about and what was it like to dive deeply into that? Well, like I said, that was that was basically Simon Rogers, then publisher of Pelgrane's uh, ask. Uh, he needed uh, uh, he had the, the rights to do a licensed Call of Cthulhu adaptation. He needed someone with cred in the Cthulhu community, if you want to call it that. And he knew that Robin and I got along, so he figured I was a good choice. And really what that was for me was just going back as far as I could to Sandy Peterson's original design, even the zeroth edition, not even the first edition <laughs> of Call of Cthulhu, where when he turned it into Chaosium, you couldn't recover sanity and the gods had no hit points. And Chaosium said, whoa, that's very, very bleak. <laughs> Maybe... <laughs> maybe game it up a little bit, Sandy, try not to kill everyone. And, I mean, it's uh, Cthulhu. <laughs> exactly. So the result is, 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 is that, but when I, when I, you know, I knew that about Sandy's original draft. And of course I'd loved Call of Cthulhu from the jump still do. It's the best game, best role-playing game ever designed. And so I, I, I really wanted to make a system that could play Sandy's original vision while also playing HP Lovecraft's vision. Mm. And then, also accommodate the sort of all right we all have tommy guns and dynamite we're going to go into the basement we're going to shoot ghouls it'll be great fun we'll go mad and scream and throw things that sort of uh for lack of a better terms convention style uh pulp uh call of cthulhu style and then that very early on made me think i we need to have sort of two separate mechanics or two separate toggles that you can build into the system that will allow those two styles of play which is an insight that i ripped off whole, whole whole hog from Alan Varney, who did it in Paranoia uh, XP, if you remember <laughs> back then, yeah. where there was a bunch of different levers and, and dials you could turn to play different kinds of paranoia. And that was such a genius piece of design that I thought, I'm going to steal that immediately. And uh, the first chance I had to use it was Trail of Cthulhu. And then the other, you know, the other sort of aesthetic choice that I made was to um, move it into the 1930s because Lovecraft, of course, writes, you know, as late as 1935, and the 30s are just a scarier decade than the 1920s, by definition. Yeah. Um, you know, Hitler, Stalin, Great Depression, Great Depression Dust Bowl, kind of, we're done there, right? Good um, times, good yeah, times. Good times, hey! <laughs> and, and so I, I just moved it into the 30s also. That meant that all of the wonderful Chaosium 20s stuff, we didn't have to, you know, s drive at. We could sort of do our own spin. If we did a London book, like I eventually did Book Hounds of London, it can be informed by the depression. It's not going to be sort of the bright young things London that the uh, Chaosium London book is. So that was part of it. And then the other thing that I did was um, to try and 
introduced the uncertainty that Lovecraft meant his mythos to represent. So when Lovecraft came up with Deep Ones, he was doing it because he was tired of everyone knowing what vampires and ghouls and werewolves and ghosts were. And so when he brings ghouls and he, he changes them up, they're different than just graveyard cannibals. Mm -hmm. uh, when he invents Deep Ones, it's a whole new kind of monster because he wants that fear of the unknown present in his in his game and uh his gods are the same thing they they contradict him themselves there's different versions and different stories we don't know what the necronomicon is we don't know where lang is mm -hmm. and he's doing that deliberately and now of course and i am by far guilty of this as anyone we've you know classified lovecraft stuff down to wiki entries and trading cards and it's all okay we know that Cthulhu is this. We know that Haster is this. We know that Yog sothoth is this. And that's the opposite of what you want. So I tried to give players permission and give keepers permission to radically change the mythos, to present it in a different way. And so that was just for all of the gods coming up with 10 or 12 entirely contradictory things that were true and presenting them in that way. And a lot of that inspiration came from the Dying Earth books that uh, Pelgrane published, where the setting books aren't, there is a blacksmith on this corner. It's like, well, I've heard there was a blacksmith on this corner. No, he's not a blacksmith. He actually uh, uh, makes uh, poison. Blacksmithing is just his cover. He's not a blacksmith at all. He's a salamander in human form who's cursed. And you don't know what's going on because the uh, the world of the dying earth is all about contingent story and uh, 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 perception and belief in a way that, you know, our world certainly is not, not at all. Um but uh, that sort of different vibes uh, on big elements of the setting, you know, again, Shadowrun has done it forever. Vampire did it. Uh, I didn't I didn't invent it, but I sort of brought it back or tried to bring it back into the Cthulhu mythos. And I think that's the other thing that people responded well uh, to Trail of Cthulhu on. Cool. That's awesome. So so from Trail of Cthulhu, let's let's head on over to Night's Black Agents. Um, so you talked about the inspiration for it, but tell us about the game itself. Uh, how, how does it work? Uh, you talked a little bit about the vampire hunting, but, um, expand on this world. Yeah. Once I came up with the basic idea that it's Jason Bourne hunting vampires, I had to think, well, does Jason Bourne work for the government? Are we just going to do Delta green only vampires? That doesn't sound fun. Um, <laughs> But Jason Bourne, of course, doesn't work for the government. He's 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 burned. He's out. He's just pursuing his own mission. And there's a, a number of of uh, spy movies, roughly that same era. Ronin, of course, being the greatest of them. John Frankenheimer's great spy movie with Robert De Niro, um, that are about these sort of little bands of former spies who are now maybe criminals who are doing stuff. Uh, sneakers is another example uh, on a, maybe a lighter note. Um, and I thought that's the vibe that you want for this game group. They're all former spies. They're burned spies. And then right around the time I thought this, the TV show Burn Notice came out, which was all about burned spies. Um, uh, uh, Maggie Q had a TV show called Nikita that was based on La Femme Nikita, mm -hmm. um, in which she's a former spy who's trying to destroy her own agency. So that was a, a big vibe in the early 2000s for some reason. It's though everyone was really mad at spy agencies. And so the um, that sort of inspired me to, make the characters these burned spies who discover oh vampires exist and we maybe were working for them and now we have to take them out because they know we know and we're gonna die if we don't and th so it becomes that born kill or be killed hunt or be hunted um destroy the thing uh before it destroys you mm -hmm. thriller cycle and the real sort of design insight there was just to watch a ton of uh, spy movies, watch the Bourne trilogy over and over again and sort of figure out the rhythm because Gumshoe is about solving mysteries. Well, uh, mean critics say that a thriller is just a mystery where you already know who did it. Mm. Um, so what you're trying to ask is not who's the bad guy. It's who's working for the bad guy. Um, what's their plan? How do I defeat them? that's the mystery it's not the you know uh oh goodness our our you know is is shadow and mr johnson going to betray me of course he's going to betray you it's right in his <laughs> name um but uh the 
the the questions, the the mysteries are the how and the where and the what, and that I think makes for sort of really fun, evocative play, and it certainly works really well in thrillers. And it was just a matter of readjusting the gumshoe rhythm to say fight scenes, danger produces story. Story drives you into more danger, right? You you yeah. risk danger to get information. Information opens you to more danger. That continues until you defeat the main threat, whatever that is. You know, at the end of the third movie, for example, for Born or right. whatever. So how did, it, it sounds like, you know, thinking about Born, who who kind of is, is stuck working on his own, is that kind of what inspired you to come up with the solo ops book as well? Well, I didn't, um, Robin, again, everything that I do is basically following along after Robin and saying, look how good Robin was. Um, <laughs> Robin had come up with Gumshoe one to one uh, and did uh, the, which is one player, one GM, and did uh, the Trail of Cthulhu Gumshoe one to one, uh, Cthulhu Confidential. And it was, you know, obvious to Kat Tobin, uh, by now publisher of Pelgrane, that lots of spy stories are solo stories. Bourne is solo, James Bond is solo, you know, mm -hmm. Sidney Bristow from Alias is solo, everyone's solo. And uh, it, the, the, the question was, can you do Cthulhu Confidential, but for spies? And uh, fortunately, she asked Gareth Hanrahan to do it instead of me. And he, of course, uh, guaranteed home run every show at the plate. He's the freaking Mike Trout of role-playing game. <laughs> um, and uh, he, you know, came up with the notion of, of uh, the contacts push and all the other sort of mm -hmm. mechanical ways to adjust from the more uh, straightforward or linear a Cthulhu style plot into the wilder, you can literally do anything uh, spy plots that uh, nice black agents uh, replicates. And so, you know, that was, that was, that was just Gar being able to take the best of those, uh, those source material and then uh, riff from uh, Robin's uh, one-to-one -one gumshoe engine and, and sort of build it out, basically replicating the same thing that I did when I turned it from a mystery to a thriller he turned it from, you know, a mystery to a thriller, but solo. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, we've we've had the uh, pleasure of running the solo ops for Night Black, Night's Black Agent twice. One of them is published on uh, our YouTube channel now. The other is going to be released in podcast form, I believe. So um, it's the the feedback has been phenomenal about oh, uh, the world, the story. Um, it's a lot of fun. And I really like that idea of having more of those options of, of one player, one GM and, and. Well, it seems to, I mean, it, it, it seems to be a natural way that a lot of people wind up playing or wind up getting into playing is their, you know, their um, uh, girlfriend is like, I, I really want to play, you know, uh, some role-playing game or other uh, you should play with me. And then you do that to make the other person happy or your, you know, your roommate in college is like, they're a big gamer, but they can't game as much as they want. so they get you in. And so a lot of gaming is done one-to-one. -one, and that was true even before we were all gaming one-to-one -one for two years. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so it, and it's also, Robin is a very big believer in emulating drama and so much drama is about the single protagonist mm -hmm. that it's, it's, it's harder to do that. You know, you can't really do a Tarzan role-playing game because there's just Tarzan. I mean, you, you play you know, the big lion, Chad Ball Job. Yeah. Well, that doesn't sound as much fun as, <laughs> frankly. I mean, it doesn't sound unfun. I say that. They don't team up and go on adventures in the same way even the Doctor Who and his companions do. Right, so right. So you, you, you have a lot of, of the source material that's really solo focused. And uh, being able to do that at the table, I think, opens up a lot of directions. And obviously, you know, you know, Cat, of course, is is full of great ideas, but there's only so much bandwidth in the universe and only so much of Gar's time uh, to, <laughs> to get another solo game out. But I think he right now is working on solo fantasy, Ooh. if I remember correctly. So it's so you know, jumping genre to genre here. Exactly. So it's so it's sort of Beowulfy, right? You're one hero, and of course, you know, um, John Hodgson just did a Beowulf game that's solo for uh, uh, fifth edition. Oh uh, wow! I didn't hear about that. Well, it's it's uh, it's amazing because I just said John Hodgson at the top of the hour, um, <laughs> and uh, he, he it's called uh, Beowulf, clever name. Um, it's for fifth edition. His company is Handyworks, and okay. uh, 
Of course, he did all the amazing art and book design like he uh, did for One Ring. So it looks amazing. Awesome. Um, yeah. So solo role playing is a thing. Um, it's been, you know, it was part of the indie scene from a while back. And, uh, you know, anything we can do to mainstream it is great because, you know, people get into the game generally one at a time and it's easier to meet them where they live than wait for them to get six friends with nothing to do on Tuesday. Right. <laughs> Fair. Uh, so so we've kind of talked through some of the, the the fun milestones. What are the challenges that you've overcome throughout your career as a game designer? I mean, I don't like to say that I've had challenges per se. Um, I mean, the challenge was paying the mortgage. That's still the challenge. Have I overcome that challenge? Well, the mortgage paid this month, so yes. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Neil Gaiman has a, has a line that I like, which is the hardest thing about being a writer is convincing your wife that napping on the couch is work. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to say that game design isn't work, but on the other hand, I, I used to uh, spread blacktop in Moore, Oklahoma. I know what actual work is, and <laughs> this is not it. So um, I'm... Uh, I've been, I was lucky to come in when I did. I've been lucky to have great colleagues like Robin and, uh, and Christian and Ross. Uh, you know, my biggest challenge has been, you know, can I stay interesting and relevant and fun? And can I stay aware of what's going on in the hobby uh, enough to make my works not just, you know, the same old, same old, which is fine, uh, you know, Fog Hat is still playing county fairs everywhere, but mm -hmm. to actually be part of that art form that, like I say, I sort of grew up with. Right. Right. Huh. Well, I like that. So what advice do you have for indie game designers that are just starting out? I mean, the great thing about designers just starting out is that they don't have to sit around waiting for someone to hire them the way that I did. Um, mm -hmm. What they can do because of uh, things like itch and drive through, uh, open gaming, uh, licenses and community content. They can walk out tomorrow with an idea for a game they love and know, write it up, put it, depending on legalities, either up with the community content, or if it's for an open system, make it their own thing, uh, put it up on, on itch or on drive through. And suddenly they're, they're, they're my colleague. We don't have to wait around for them to be noticed at a convention. They don't have to buy me drinks to get work. Not that I've ever been in the publishing business, but they don't have to do it. And uh, then they can do that. And that, that's wonderful. So my advice is, you know, have a reason for doing it, right? Have an artistic vision, something that you think you can do, even if it's just, I really think Hobgoblins should be a fun, playable race in D&D. &D, that's great. You know, people think that. Um whatever your, your vision or your notion is, you can realize it far more rapidly, far more fully and far more easily than I ever could. I mean, my advice would be, you know, know about contract law, know about accounting, know about, you know, know either know about layout or make really good friends with someone who's good at layout and book design. Um, those are the elements that are really gonna, as you get, get forward, separate you from the rest of the pack is being able to, be professional, stay professional, not get too far out over your skis financially, and then make sure your books look better than the other person's books. And right now with some of the stuff that's going on, that's harder than ever. I mean, but the great thing is, you know, not just the gigantic, you know, behemoth of Free League, but things like Mothership that have got this crazy good visual aesthetic. Everyone, you know, every young artist, it seems like that I meet has a crazy good visual aesthetic that would translate super well and they just have to do that and it's a million times easier than it was in the 90s when i started uh doing this professionally you don't have to have anyone's permission you can do it entirely electronically you don't have to mortgage your house again to print nine thousand copies and keep them in the garage you can do kickstarter you can do uh, mm -hmm. patreon or other kind of crowdfunding there's so many more ways just be smart about you know your money in and your money out and make sure that your stuff is just that little bit better than the next person's. And I feel like if you're working on a, a property that you know or, or a project that you love, that comes through. Uh, I, I can tell you, writing something that you're bored writing 
no one will be excited to play. I promise mm -hmm. that. So um, uh, just don't ever write something that you don't want to be writing right then. And you'll be doing, you know, certainly better than I was at your age. That, that's really helpful advice in terms of the, where you started even with the, the layout and the accounting and the legality and stuff like that, like knowing what you're missing or what your strengths are versus what gaps you have. And, right. and it, it's criminal that every right art people. school in America doesn't have a, a mandatory business unit, right? Because if you're going to try and be a creative person for a living, absolutely, you should know what a contract looks like. Right. Absolutely, you should know what you know your tax situation is going to be. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you're going to learn it and you're not going to like the tuition. <laughs> <laughs> fair. Yeah. <laughs> very fair. Uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, so I, I, I've been saving this part uh, for later because it's it's so well known and so exciting uh, and, and so many people love the world. But what was your experience as lead designer for uh, the wildly popular Vamps the Masquerade 5th edition? I mean, that was, that was a, an odd experience in a lot of ways. I got a, I got a call from uh, Martin Ellerickson, who at that time was, I think, creative uh, manager for the White Wolf property at, at uh, Paradox. And he said, we'd like to hire you to write or to, to be part of the design team for Vampire 5th Edition. And I said, are you sure you have the right guy? I'm kind of on the other team. I'm Team Van Helsing. <laughs> And he said, no, that's exactly why we want you. And I said, all right, I'm happy to take a meeting. And uh, he, you know, we got back and forth to each other. I flew out to Sweden with uh, 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 the other people on the initial team. Uh, we threw some pitches together. Uh, they sort of gave us their vision for the property. Uh, then um, they sent me back, you know, to America and said, you know, start designing and and martin was very open and very he was like literally anything you turn out as designer by that time i was lead designer um is going to be good it, it, you know make it card based make it you know pogs make it gm less i don't care you're going to do a great thing and i said seriously are you sure you have the right person i think you're thinking of uh emily care boss when you say things like that <laughs> And he said, nope, nope, you're, you're the man, you're the maestro, go to it. So, you know, I was not going to have pogs. Uh, I was going to try and build uh, something that a vampire player would recognize. Die 10 dice pools. But I, the, the mechanics of vampire in older systems, when I played it, it was very hard to figure out what your odds were for anything. Mm -hmm. It just was that one step past counterintuitive because it was... <laughs> You know, not just the number of dice, but also the success number went up and down. Different dice meant different things. Uh, the, uh, botches just really interrupted play for me. It's like I'm this amazing vampire and literally 10% of the time I'm walking into a wall. That's terrible. <laughs> um, so I, I just, I said, I'm stripping the stuff that, fi that get in my way when I would play out. And I'm putting in, you know, sort of uh, smooth... You know, smooth mechanics. It may not be the great Emily Care Boss super mechanics. We're not, you know, Miles Davis here, but I think you can get, you know, uh, Michael Buble mechanics out of me, right? You know, smooth jazz mechanics that everyone will listen to and like. And um, and so that was the goal. And then uh, the great uh, 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 Kareem Muammar, who was uh, on the Swedish side of the team, had come up with the hunger mechanic for the dice where you, um, as your vampire gets hunger, you add more and more hunger dice to your pools. And when they, uh, you know, come up, you suddenly have to frenzy and feed on people and, and stuff. And that method of representing hunger was so true and great and obviously uh, part of, you know, the vampire feel and ethos better than I'm tracking my blood points, right? Uh, that, you know, I literally changed maybe 5% of his original mechanic before it goes in. So, you know, Kareem is, I don't know if he's unsung, but he's certainly undersung as the co-designer of, of the game. Did an amazing job with that hunger mechanic. And then once we sort of had the notion of here are the die pools, I'm going to add criticals. 
and I'm taking away botches. And I came up with the uh, messy critical, the notion that if you if your critical depends on hunger dice, well, you've, you've solved it, but you've solved it the way the beast would, not the way that the human would. <laughs> and that and that creates some of the anarchic fun of botches without the, you know, ruining your forward momentum of botches. Right. And, and then a lot of it was just, how do I take this, you know, streamline it, put it into a, a, a seam system and then build out the things that everyone says vampire is always about, but it never is. So I took touchstones from Vampire the Requiem so that you had a mechanical reason to uh, be connected to humanity. Um, I uh, I developed a system for the thing that occasionally people would do when it's like, oh, I remember when I was a 150 year old vampire, just a little kid, uh, we used to do this. And I said, let's have a system for that. Let's let it have mechanical consequences in the game because that's my, my sort of uh, mantra is that if you tell me your game is a game about X, and there are no mechanics for X, then your game is not about X. Your mm -hmm. game is just about whatever you have mechanics for. Right. And, and so a lot of it was just represent those things mechanically. And then a lot of it is just, there's, you know, 25 years of vampire. It has to be sort of boiled down. The cruft has to be stripped out. It's the same stuff you do with any new edition and uh, try and, you know, straighten up everything. And a lot of it is uh, very much what Paradox wanted, what White Wolf, uh, the White Wolf team wanted was to make a game that was, that felt like a game for 2016, 2017, not a game that felt like 1991. Mm -hmm. But we, I still wanted it to feel like the game in 1991 felt then. Right. Because I remember, you know, the first moment where it's like, there are a lot of women at this co game convention all of a sudden what's that about and discovering they were all playing vampire and thinking well that's obviously where i need to be you know <laughs> focusing as a creator um is the other half of the universe and, and so that you know that really uh you know it struck a giant nerve with people it really you know blew some minds made a ton of new gamers of uh opened up the universe of gaming in a, in a huge way. And so much of it was just about the sort of the, the mood and the feel in the game books. And so little of it was the rules. Yep. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was like, could we just put some rules under any of this? That would be so nice <laughs> because again, we've had, and again, I, I keep saying Emily care boss, but anyone you interview who doesn't should be shunned. Um, uh, Emily care boss had said, what if we had a mechanical representation, a game representation of romance? Right. Mm -hmm. and, and she did that in, you know, 2004, or 2003, whatever it was when she did Breaking the Ice. And it, how have we gone this far without that? That's like if the first Hollywood screen kiss hadn't been until 1938. Right. <laughs> it's just amazing to me. Um, it, it's a young art form, but in many ways, it's been a very stupid and retrograde art form. Um, but, you know, Emily is carrying us all on her shoulders. God bless her. Um, so so, so it was just a matter of taking those kinds of insights uh, and putting them into the vampire core text and saying, you have our permission to never roll a die if you don't want to. You have our permission to roll dice for this if you want to. You can roll dice sometimes and not roll dice other times and just lay it all out as sort of best practices as everyone has been playing games, uh, certainly since 2001, when the sort of indie movement began, sort of get some of that design uh play at the table sensibility into vampire where it belonged well it's it's really neat to like kind of see you you get real animated talking about it and uh and talking about what you were able to contribute what uh your colleagues were able to contribute and also um the tone like clearly you know uh vampire uh mythos is is a passion of yours uh, so I have to ask, what vampire clan are you and why? I mean, I think that I, you know, gun to my head, I'm Tremere. <laughs> and I know that's super stereotypical, but I'll, there's two reasons. Not just because they're the ones with giant libraries full of magic books, but also <laughs> because um, Keith Herber wrote the Tremere Splat book. And it was by far the best of the first edition Splat books. It may still be the best Splat book. And Keith Herber was such a great writer and such a great person that 
his writing on the Tremere just really impressed me in a way. It, it, I don't know if it's like a super mature answer or super juvenile answer, but that's my answer. And it, and yes, libraries full of magic books. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, when I <laughs> when I uh, when I uh, nerfed the Tremere and blew up their prime chantry when I did fifth edition, you know, that came from the heart. Right. That wasn't. <laughs> right here right in the fields <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i love that that's that's awesome um and i like your like reason for it is is like fanboying over it <laughs> i mean it, it uh, i if, if keith herbert were still with us uh and sadly he's not you know i'd be fanboying him to his face or at least <laughs> constantly on you know twitter or whatever uh but as it was he had such a huge influence on the way that I ran Call of Cthulhu, on the way I thought about game design, on the way I wrote words. Um, just a, a giant, and I don't think that enough people uh, recognize how great he was. And I'll tell you, you know, he's he may have been the reason that I stayed with Vampire, you know, after that hump. It was, you know, well, part of it was I was getting work from White Wolf, but another big part of it was, you know, he had shown me this sort of human doorway into the into the setting that uh, some of the other writers had, you know, in their excitement, uh, neglected. Awesome. So what other items or, or ideas are in development with you now? I mean, right now we are finishing up uh, Blood Sigils and the Vampire Player's Guide, both for Vampire uh, with Renegade Studios, who's the licensor now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they've been nice enough to uh, ask me to help out. So we just did uh, Second Inquisition, which is out now. And uh, same deal with uh, Player's Guide. Uh, Blood Sigils was sort of half my pitch, half Elisa Teague, who runs the game, the tabletop section at Renegade. Uh, sh she said, oh, uh, Paradox really wants a blood magic book. And I, I, I guess I, we just don't have a good idea for how to do it. And then she looked at me on the Zoom call and I said, well, I'm not doing it. We're very busy. I, I can't be bothered to do this vampire magic book and it of course 45 seconds later i thought but what if it's a book about the blood magic scene right it's not just a list of spells or god forbid you know a new magic system which we don't need what if it's more about the kind of weirdos even for vampires who go after magic who do sorcery and then i had come up with for vampire fifth for the the thin blood alchemy uh, as the Thin Bloods magic, because I alchemy is fun, and I figured the Thin Bloods needed something, and so <laughs> uh, we could combine Thin Blood alchemy with the older Tremere and Banu Hakim uh, blood sorcery, and that uh, sort of clash of culture inside this subculture. I think really, you know, everything from Fast and the Furious to Uncut Gems to uh, Ninth Gate can be seen as these sort of weird obsessive subculture movies and yeah. that's that's a good vibe i like that vibe I, I i like it in my life in fact um maybe because i'm part of a weird obsessive subculture um <laughs> but uh but making making that the focus of the blood magic book made it very interesting and exciting to me so when i pitched it to elisa she said great i'll put you down for february then fine awesome so uh that that those are in sort of uh, those last two are in sort of final final stages before they uh, go to print. Um, and then in the interstices between those, I'm uh, working on Hellenistica, which is my 5e campaign book or campaign setting book, which I'm doing with John Hodgson at Handiwork and is uh, Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition set in the historical period that is most like a Dungeons and Dragons game, which is to say the Hellenistic era after yeah. Alexander the Great's death, because you have literal piles of gold lying around. You have literal people wandering from city to city with their swords, getting into trouble and getting jobs from local well-connected uh, barons. You have uh, gods intervening in everybody's life. You have monsters over every hill, right? If you read uh, Aristotle or Pausanias or anyone, they're like, yep, manticores, they definitely exist. They're in India. I saw them. Um, everything you think of in d, &D you've got ruins. You've got giant ruins left by cultures that no one remembers. You've got the seven wonders of the world. You've got everything that a D&D &D game has and you have it in the real world. So this is just sort of the good parts version of the Hellenistic era uh, then tuned for uh, Dungeons and Dragons. I ran that 
uh, in Thirteenth Age for my player group for three years, so I know it's got legs. Awesome. And uh, John has been very patient, waiting for me to steal time from other clients to write him another eight thousand words and send it off. <laughs> so if you're watching, John, I'm still writing. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I, I want to hear a little bit about uh, one of your other projects. Uh, you're you've been producing a podcast. Uh, uh, is it a recent thing or have you been doing this for a while now? Well, Robin Laws, who I've mentioned previously, and I do a podcast uh, called Ken and Robin Talk About Stuff. And when you say I've been producing it, um, I am the literal opposite of producing it. Um, I am content. Um, <laughs> we have a, a, an engineer named Rob Borges who makes my babbling into a podcast at some point. Robin does Fair. all the posting and dealing with the internet part. I literally just... Uh, sit here and chat with Robin, uh, which I would do <laughs> anyway, if right? I could. And we just recorded our 500th episode uh, <gasps> Tuesday. 500? That, yeah, so that that drops um, uh, like a week from Friday, uh, from, from now. Um, so yeah, and that's almost 10 years of the show. We'll be doing a 10th wow. anniversary episode. It's every week on Fridays. Ken and Robin talk about stuff. Uh, you can check Ken and Robin talk about stuff.com or you can go to wherever you dial your podcasts up. And if we're not there, yell and demand that we be added. And if it is there, subscribe and rate us five stars. I think you're supposed to say that, that's the law, right? <laughs> so, so what kind of stuff do you end up talking about? Anything? Well, every, every, every segment has, it opens with the gaming hut where uh, Robin and I talk about some, you know, thing to do with tabletop gaming specifically so it can be anything from how do i deal with a player who wants to go off by themselves how do i structure a dungeon to make it more interesting than other dungeons um how what are the basic principles of game design we did a, a few episodes on that uh and it's it's you know really the sort of core stuff robin had the early insight that no one wanted to listen to the two of us talk about the same thing for an hour so the podcast is broken up into four huts and then in the other huts, it can vary. So it might be the food hut where you talk about some restaurant or some recipe that we've discovered in Cinema Hut, where we talk about if Robin's just been back from the Toronto Film Festival, or we talk about Ooh. some aspect of movies that we're into. Uh, there's the Elliptony Hut, where we talk about weird stuff, uh, magic and UFOs and Sasquatches and conspiracy. Uh, we have a conspiracy corner, which I guess is next door to the Elliptony Hut. Uh, <laughs> there's a segment called Ten Ken's Time Machine, where uh, I tell Robin how I would change history uh, to bring about some desired outcome or how I did change history to bring about our outcome. Sometimes we do that. Um, and uh, a narrative hut where Robin uh, lays down how to you know, present narrative in, in fiction or in film or whatever. Um, so it's just really whatever we decide we want to do. If you're a backer on the Patreon, um, then you get to request things and then Robin has to assign them into a hut. Uh, uh, so, uh, they, you know, things vary. Uh, sometimes stuff comes up in the news, like when that uh, magic rock broke open in Japan and the evil nine-tailed fox demon got out. Everyone wanted to get our take on that. So that, <laughs> that became an episode, I think, of the, um, I forget it was the Monster Hut or the um, rip, from the, rip from the Headlines. We have a couple of huts that could have fit into. But um, yeah, so it's, it, you know, we keep it loose. It, it changes around, but everything sort of comes back around to, well, now that we've discussed the Templars and their possible uh, existence in Newfoundland, how would we game that? So <laughs> the last little bit of most of the huts is how to use that at your game or how to, you know, you know, it might be uh, one of us riffing on how to do a Yellow King or Fall of Delta Green campaign using the material um, or just how to put this wild historical character into your, into your game. How do they fit? I love that. That's really cool. Uh, I haven't gotten to check it out yet, but 500 episodes in, I have been using, uh, I, I just ran out of my um, usual crime junkie shows. So there we go. Uh, <laughs> it's time to get into something new. And that sounds right up my alley. I'm really Fantastic. excited. Fantastic. Cool. Uh, well, where where can we fo follow you and find you and hear more about what's going on? Well, I mean, the, the, the podcast is not a bad way. Uh, we have a segment called Among My Many Hats, where we uh, take our subtle plugs and turn them much less subtle. Uh, <laughs> there's um, another, uh, the, the, uh, the, there's uh, the uh, 
cpagexx column on the Pelgrane website where Robin and I uh, throw stuff up. Uh, obviously, follow uh, Pelgrane to see what Robin or I are up to. Follow us, us on social media. Um, I'm at Kenneth Height on Twitter. Um, I'm Kenneth Height on the Facebooks. Uh, I'm, I think that I'm, I'm also on Instagram, but unless you want pictures of my cat and my fire pit, that doesn't really tell you a lot of useful information. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, Twitter and Facebook are probably the best way to, to stay in touch. Uh, or certainly if you and I are both at a convention, uh, I said earlier, don't have to buy me a drink, but it would certainly be nice. And then, <laughs> you know, I will talk your ear off. You will, you will regret that, uh, impulse as rapidly as you possibly could. And then, um, every so often I'm on shows like this, I try and plug them on the Twitter. So I guess for the one-stop shop, uh, uh, follow me on Twitter or Facebook and you'll get most of what's going on, but you have to really follow. You can't just let the algorithm do it. You have to put me in a list or something. <laughs> awesome. Well, it, it's, we're getting close to the top of the hour and it was really great to, to hear about your experience, your perspective and um, all your wonderful contributions to the gaming industry. So uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, and I look forward to a chance where I get to play with you. Oh, that would be lovely. Um, I look forward to that as well. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, thanks for dialing me up or <laughs> discording me. I don't even know what you say now, but thanks for that. Of course. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We'll be right back, everyone. Up next is the next episode of Shadowrun Sixth World Emerald Glitch. One of the staples of shadow work is the infiltration of some dark corporate facility, and our runners are deep within the warehouse where they hope to find their technomancer quarry. But where is she? And where is the secret laboratory everyone keeps talking about? Where is the frog shaman she's been dating? And whose affairs have they really been stumbling into? Join us for the case of the glitchy Technomancer coming up next. And don't forget to get your free entry to win a Shadowrun Sixth World Core Rulebook Seattle Edition by typing hashtag RemPC into the chat. You can get additional entries to win by going to our donation page, www.remalternus.com slash Nguyen or www.patreon.com slash RemAlternus. All donations help us to pay our cast and crew and keep producing content. And our biggest donors can have a message read at the end of the episode by the cast member of their choice. So check it out. Thank you all for joining and we'll see you next time where we will be live at Origins Game Fair in Columbus, Ohio, giving you a sneak peek behind the scenes at the vendor hall. Come visit us if you'll be there at booth 525 and 259. We even have events at the member spotlight table if you want to play a game or two with us. So we'll see you there, REM PCs. <laughs>